This program is made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Nerd TV. Episode 12 Robert Cringely interviews TCPIP co inventor Bob Kahn, November 29th, 2005. Welcome to Nerd TV. Thank you. It's really great to talk to you again. It's been seven years. And, um, uh, you know, last time we spoke, of course, it was for uh, my uh, uh, Nerds 2.01 Brief History of the Internet. And now we're talking for Nerd TV. And it's more about you. And I, how did you get interested in becoming an engineer or a scientist? I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. It, uh, you know, when I went into, into college uh, in the first place, I guess my thought was uh, I was interested in building things. I was interested in how things worked. Uh, I was sort of interested in mathematics. I was interested in science in general. I wasn't too skilled in the arts. I mean, I never saw myself as a, you know, a writer or a uh, an actor. Certainly not uh, somebody in 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 politics or mm -hmm. I just didn't see myself in any of those fields. So I thought I'd try industrial engineering. You know. But there really was no program that I could get into that where I was going to school. And so then I said, well, maybe chemical engineering. But I didn't like the lab work, so I ended up in electrical engineering. And the thing that appealed to me about it was it, it kind of had a very rigorous mathematical basis to some of the areas of that field. And you could actually build real things. So I got into electrical engineering. And where was this? This was at City College in New York. Actually, it was a Queens College City College program. And when I graduated with that degree, I went to work at, uh, at Bell Laboratories. Um, briefly, I thought a little you know, practical experience would be a good thing before going on to graduate school. So I, I went to work at the original headquarters, or at least it was the headquarters of Bell Labs in those days. It was at 463 West Street in New York, right mm -hmm. on the Hudson River. So you could actually watch the Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary's coming in every, every other week and coming in and going out. What, what, what year was this? Um, I started at Bell Labs right after graduation, which was, I guess, around January 1960. Okay. And I was at the labs for a number of years, although uh, I went to graduate school in September of that same year. So formally, I was there full-time for maybe nine months, mm -hmm. and then I was back there summers for a number of years after that. Um, that was before they had built Homedale in mm -hmm. New Jersey, and so that was really where the headquarters was. But much of the technical work took place out at Murray Hill, New Jersey, uh, which I guess was, the last I saw was a Lucent uh, operation, mm -hmm. and at Whippany, New, New Jersey. And they also built a plant out at Homedale, which maybe a few years after I joined them. And eventually they got rid of the New York plant completely. Mm -hmm. I think it became a, a condominium of some sort. Was Both it fun? There. Oh, I loved it. I mean, Bell Labs had a certain culture and rigor to it. Um, it really was a natural resource back in its day, of course, it's now gone. Yeah. Um, and, um, but it was a different time, a different age, and it was kind of a great experience for me. I worked with some wonderful people there, um, got to learn about big systems, and unlike many of my colleagues who went into the more hardcore technical pieces of the business, like, you know, color television or coding theory or various uh, development of magnetic core devices, things like that, uh, I got into more the systems aspects of the Bell system, um, things like, uh, you know, how do you place lines in the Bell system for efficient performance? Mm -hmm. Where should they go? How do you how do you maintain the cost effectiveness of the system? How do you guarantee certain quality of service, degrees of performance? And so it was very much of a mathematically oriented analysis of a very complex system. And then I went I went to graduate school. I got a uh, NSF fellowship went to uh, Princeton mm -hmm. uh, that fall, and it seems to me that it uh, this really prepared you for the kind of work that you were doing later on. You could say that now, but certainly I had no you idea. Had no, idea. Back, no idea back then. So it was just really interesting job. Worked with some wonderful people, very motivated, very dedicated, very smart people. And then I ended up going into graduate school. I was it was a small class. Princeton was uh, really just building its department back then. Mm -hmm. um, and this was still electrical engineering? It was still electrical engineering, yeah. but most of the work that I did was really math and, and physics mm -hmm. kind of work. 
a lot of self-study uh, over there, and, and they gave you ample opportunity to figure out how to fend for yourself. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could take classes, you could do self-study. Uh, you had a variety of requirements that you had to meet, and of course, tests that you had to pass, mm -hmm. and then of course, you had to write a thesis. And so, I finished the thesis uh, in 1964, and uh, then ended up uh, becoming a faculty member up at MIT. Okay. Right after that. It's interesting. I, um, you know, I actually got an honorary degree from Princeton in 1998, even though I have a regular doctoral uh -huh. degree. And uh, you know, at first I thought they had made a mistake and that, you know, they had just forgotten or something like that. But they said, no, no, this, this was intentional. We really intended it. Um, and when my thesis advisor retired from Princeton, uh, most of his students came to, you know, wish him sure. well and give him a nice send off. And when he came to introduce me, I was like student number six. And my advisor was a gentleman named John Thomas, a very distinguished gentleman who now lives out in California. Um, when he got to introduce me, um, he said, well, Bob was you know, student number six, and he's the only student who ever wrote two PhD the theses. And I'm scratching my head trying to figure out, how come I don't know that? You know? <laughs> he says, well, what happened was he had done enough work early on that we knew it was sufficient, but he hadn't spent enough time in the program, so we assigned him to work with another faculty member who was actually still on the faculty and you know, a good friend of mine named B.D. Liu. And you know, he and I worked together, and we did some additional work. And so the thesis was sort of a patchwork of you know, wow. an, an A plus B thesis. And so when I got up, they the manipulated you. No, 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 no. It was a great time. I, yeah, okay. I enjoyed every minute of it. But when I got up to Princeton and they said, "Could you say some words about your time at, at Princeton?" That was one of the stories I, I told. I said, "You know, quite frankly, I thought they had made a mistake." But when I sort of thought about it, I realized since I had written two PhD theses according to my advisor, it was really only fitting. So. Uh, but, and effectively, that was your third. That was no two theses, one one, oh, one, one degree. degree. Oh, one degree. So um, you went to. And MIT. that's also that's also the time I, you know, in between finishing all the coursework and the studying and writing the thesis, I spent quite a bit of time uh, trying to hone my golf game that summer. I just decided to back away for mm -hmm. a while, and uh, so I, I explained how the other thing that uh, we had done that year was got our golf scores really you know, in good shape by playing four rounds a day, seven days a week for something like four months or five months in a row. That's 72 holes a of day. golf a day? Walking, carrying our bags. And I played with another fellow there who was, you know, really fun golfer to play with. And mm -hmm. it turned out he was actually at the meeting because I had no way to verify this story. Uh -huh. He was actually at the meeting where he stood up in the back, raised his hands and said, hi, Bob. And it turned out he was the chairman of the physics department. <laughs> <laughs> uh, small world. Small world, and you still golf? I do, but not very much, and I don't play very well. And the older I get, it seems to me, the less distance I get, and the less. Uh, but you, can, you know, it'd be really good. You got to play a lot. I mean, because it's all in muscle memory. It's yeah. all how, you know, you feel up there. It's like piano playing. If you got to think about what finger to hit, what key next, you'll never play well. Your fingers learn how to hit the keys, and you know, That's brain right. is just forcing the fingers to do what they know how to do. That's right. So if you're playing all the time. That's uh, that's sort of the first step in, in in getting good. Well, you have to have some talent as well. But if you don't play all the time, you'll never you'll never score really well. So at you, least in my opinion. So you you went from Princeton to MIT. Can you characterize the two institutions? Well, they're both well-known institutions, well known institutions. Obviously, are they different? Well, Princeton was um, a rural school. Um, you know, we were, you know, an hour from New York City. I used to go in periodically, take the uh, the bus because I had gotten subscription tickets to the Metropolitan Opera. So I used to go to watch opera performances uh, every now and then, which um, was about the the closest you could get to big city culture was take a bus ride downtown. They had quite a bit of local activities at Princeton, but it was mainly a rural kind of culture. Um, wonderful uh, learning experience, a lot of social activities, you know, everything that goes along with, uh, you know, uh, 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 a college town. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a, a small college town. Yeah. Football during the fall weekends and basketball during the year and, and so forth. Um, MIT, of course, is right in the middle of a, 
in our city. It's in the Boston area, in Cambridge, right across the Charles River. Um, very intense, um, very motivated people out there. I mean, people who are really trying to make a difference in the world, you know, either in terms of inventing something or making something better. Um, very intensive, um, almost compulsive environment to uh, stay on top of, uh, of your field. Mm -hmm. And I think the, one of the things that, that was true for me at MIT when I was there is I, I made some very uh, good friends, a lot of lasting friends, um, and I think every single one of them was intensely motivated to make a difference. Uh, and it's something that you don't get at every school. Yeah. I mean, many people think in educational experiences, you know, an educational experience just so you can learn and be able to practice in your field. And here the motivation was much more around making a substantive difference. Hmm. And I remember I, I was sort of the um, I was sort of the mathematician on the staff there, although they have some very good mathematical people, mm -hmm. um, including Claude Shannon, who was sure. a mathematician from Bell Laboratories, well known for his work in starting information theory. Mm -hmm. uh, but an awful lot of very good people, and uh, you know, I knew I was I was good, but um, it, the thing I was lacking was any practical experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd come up through a much more theoretical kind of a background, so the gentleman who ran the group one of the people who I really looked up to, him Jack Wozencraft, and he took me aside one day, we were having just kind of a friendly chat about how things are going, and, you know, he said, um, I don't know whether I asked him whether he had any advice or whether it was just gratuitous, but he said, you know, the thing you might want to consider is just taking a year or so off, take a leave of absence, and go apprentice yourself to somebody who knows how to build real things. Mm -hmm. So it's a thing that's different between yourself and all the other members of the faculty. They've all been involved in building real things, mm -hmm. either at Lincoln Laboratory sure. or in the Army Signal Corps and in industry, and I had not had that experience. So I, you know, I really trusted this fellow's judgment, you know. That's what led you to BBNN? And I decided virtually on the spot to go take a leave of absence, and he gave me a list of names of people that I could go talk to, and I ended up deciding to go to Bolperanica Newman, which at that time was a small consulting firm uh, in the Cambridge area. Mm -hmm. It was maybe uh, about as far in the other distance direction from where I lived as MIT was in, in, in the other direction. Uh, and I met a gentleman there um, named Jerry Elkind, who uh, and, and Jordan Baruch actually was the first one I talked to there, and they persuaded me that that was a reasonably good place for me to consider, and so I took a position there, and I started to work on computer networking, mm -hmm. thinking that that was a really interesting area, get mm -hmm. your fingers dirty. And I wasn't thinking about building networks at the time, I was thinking about doing something more practical, rather than just solving math problems, figuring out how to design a system that might actually perform a function. Sure. And so that's what I was working on. I had not heard of DARPA at the time. Mm -hmm. It was called ARPA back then. Yeah. Uh, although BBNN had some support from DARPA, or they, they had just gotten some support to work in the computer field. Yeah. I didn't consider myself a computer person at the time. My background really was more communications. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, uh, you know, that's what I was, thought I was working on, a communications problem. Mm -hmm. But there were an awful lot of people around me in that very group who were at the forefront of computer research. And I got myself totally immersed into the computer side of things as well. Um, people working on operating systems and languages and, and, and people who I still hear from, you know, to this very day. Um, and I think that was an environment that made a big difference for me because it suddenly gave me a visibility into the computer side of things that augmented what I was doing on the communication side motivated me to think about networking for computers rather than networking just for the point of moving bits around. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you looked at the history of information theory, they, they almost distinguished themselves in that field from not wanting to apply any semantics to the bits that were being sent. That's and right. Here you were talking about how would the computer use it and what's it for and things like that. It was rather a different take on the subject. So, so in essence, a bit isn't a bit. A know? bit is something for the computer to use. Well, I know, but, I, but I mean, in, in the, from the information theory standpoint, you know, a bit is a bit is a bit. But, but if you if you need the bit to arrive at a certain point to to perform a certain function in a in a, in a computer program, then that bit is more important. 
But I wasn't actually thinking at that level. It was more like, you know, how do you get a computer connected to this thing, and what yeah. would the computer do with it in terms of how operating yeah. systems work and the like. So it was a pretty interesting experience for me. Now, this was before the ARPANET. Yeah, this was before the ARPANET. This was roughly 1966 by then. Okay. Um, and so I've been working on this, and, and, and a lot of people were telling me that this was just sort of a, a waste of time because networking wasn't really likely to be a very you know, important field going forward. And they could have been right. I mean, I didn't know, but my gut feeling told me that that, that, that wasn't right, that computers really had a more important role to play. I mean, those are the days when batch processing was really de rigueur. That's what most of the big companies had. And there were only a, probably a few hundred companies in the country that really could afford the biggest machines. Mm -hmm. Um, so we weren't talking about individuals having personal computers yeah. and any of that sort of stuff. And time sharing hadn't really taken off uh, uh, in a big time. I mean, people had built some early time sharing systems, but they were very specialized, mainly in the research community. Um, and yet, the networks really were intended to deal with the interactive time sharing systems. This this was the the beauty of the vision that uh, J C R Licklider had in the early days when he talked about interactive computing and man-machine interaction and networks to cause them to all be linked. So these, these ideas were swirling in the community, but people really hadn't focused on how would you actually build something like this to actually make it, make it work. And I started to work on the details of had actually designed such a net, how would you make it work? Not thinking that we would actually build it, yeah. that we'd just go through the exercise and, and then I'd end up back in teaching. Did but, you, did you, but along the way, we found, I learned about DARPA. Yeah, and I, not only did I learn about them, but you know, I learned that they were actually interested in causing a network to be built, and you know, I was asked to sort of share with them some of the memos I had been writing on different issues, whether it be error control or flow control or you know whatever, and DARPA ended up putting out a bid, and it was called an RFQ, a request for quotations on a network that they wanted built, and. Uh, I ended up writing the technical part of the proposal for BBN, and I, I didn't even assume at that point that I'd be involved in building it. I figured I'd just help write the proposal. But it turned out that we won the proposal and that we needed somebody to be kind of responsible for evolving the system design as time went on. So I decided to continue on at BBN to see the network actually get built, and of course, once we had done that, I got offered a job by DARPA to come down and eventually ended up running the whole office down there. So, it, I, I mean, I, I do whitewater canoeing. It was one of my other things I like to do. And so it's like putting a canoe into a raging rapid, you know. And once you're in the boat, there, you, it's hard to get out. <laughs> you got to sort of, of course. So, shoot so, the course. So you thought you were writing this proposal that would might go nowhere. Well, no, I knew it was going to DARPA. I know, but but might not be success, Might not be accepted. Any proposal can be not funded. That's right. And and instead, it changed your life. It did. I, teach, I, 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 I was involved with a set of other people at BBNN in, in a group that was led by Frank Hart, involved uh, some other people there that were really uh, real-time system developers. These were people who knew how to build things. Uh, and I sort of came armed with the, mainly the ideas. Mm -hmm. And so together, we actually ended up putting together a system and actually built it and deployed it. There have been books written about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, very interesting book that Katie Hefner wrote called mm -hmm. Where Wizards Stay Up Late. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Katie and I talked a lot about what was in the book because in some of her early drafts, uh, you know, I, I felt she didn't understand the full story of what had actually happened. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a really good read, and, and for the most part, it, it tells the story in an interesting fashion. Um, Mitch Waldrop wrote another book called The Dream Machine that, that again, does a, a similar kind of thing from the point of view of the computing industry, building off of Licklider's points mm -hmm. of view. Um, so, you know, I was involved in that sort of right to the the very end. Once we had a, to the point where we knew it worked and had been deployed, I ended up putting on a demonstration of the net, the first public demonstration of the of the network uh, at the Washington Hilton in mm -hmm. 1972. It was October of 1972, and we got contributions, a lot of different terminals. It, it was the event that caused the network to become real. Mm -hmm. We had to get the machines working. We had to get the protocols working, we had to get everything, you know, it was the speed. deadline. It was the deadline, right? It was the final exam and you know, right after that finished, 
you know, I became a, a DARPA employee and stayed at DARPA for about 13 years. Now, at that point in 72, you'd started in 66, 67? With BBN, yeah. Uh, and, and so you had multiple nodes on the network. I mean, the first imp was in uh, UCLA. The, con the contract was awarded in, I want to say, January of 1969, yeah. and it was a kind of a nine-month delivery cycle. Mm -hmm for the first node on the net. We called them interface message processors or IMPs. Mm -hmm. And these were really packet switches built out of mini computers. They, we used Honeywell 516s. Yeah, they the size of a phone booth. Yeah, or a, a refrigerator, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, heavy as can be. And, uh, um, but they worked. Yeah. And they worked out of the box, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, nine months. We had the first one, 10 months, we had the second one, 11 months, the third one. So by December of 1969, we had a little four-node network deployed on the West Coast. One at UCLA, one at Stanford Research Institute up in Menlo Park, one at the University of California at Santa Barbara. That was the third one. The fourth one was at the University of Utah. It's a little triangle in California and a little spur out to Utah. And based on how well that worked, DARPA was reserving the right to put more nodes on the net, and of sure. course it worked so well that they immediately went into the second phase and that turned it from a four node net into a 19 node net and then eventually it became somewhat over a hundred nodes mm -hmm. um, until it was finally uh, split into two pieces in 1983. One piece remained a kind of research net for the research community, the other one was taken over by the military for some of its more uh, operational kinds of needs. So they, sure. they redeployed those nodes to military bases and other places that they felt comfortable with rather than leaving all the nodes on, let's say, university campuses. Um, so that was uh, really the very first computer network that was ever built. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we were just very fortunate to have been involved in it. Um, you know, the, the, there, there were several people who were involved as well as myself. There was a gentleman at DARPA named Larry Roberts, who sure. managed the project. Larry was a kind of, I, I think of him more as like the producer and architect. I mean, he was sort of masterminding the effort. But as I later found out, because I had the job that he had, you know, shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. you can't really become an implementer from that point of view. Mm -hmm. And so Larry was really orchestrating it, and I was sort of doing the hardcore system design, and this other group of BBN were really responsible for the implementation. Days, you know, get the hardware built, get it checked out, write the software, get the protocols done. And in addition, there were a set of people in the community who were involved in getting their machines connected and helping to figure out what protocols the computers would use to talk to themselves because it's one thing to move the bits around, it's another thing for the computers to actually make use of it. And that's, that's the basis on which I ended up meeting Vint Cerf who I then collaborated with on the internet side mm -hmm. of the story, which is really something that started after I got to DARPA. So you're, you're at DARPA, and, and, and having built the ARPANET, you know, having participated in the building of the ARPANET and specifying it and doing a lot of the theoretical work, uh, it had protocols, but when you were at DARPA, you felt the need to develop a new protocol. Why, why did that come about? Well. I mean, there, there was quite a bit of theoretical work on the um, on the ARPANET, but it was mainly done by people like Lynn Kleinrock mm -hmm. at UCLA. Lynn sure. had a number of students that were looking at ways of predicting performance and analyzing things, and there was quite a bit of work done on, at the simulation level by Howard Frank and his people at uh, Network Analysis uh, Corporation up in uh, Glen Cove, New York. Um, and we were really doing the engineering of the system. We were building it. There was not a lot of theoretical work going on. We had to design algorithms. We had to figure out how to make things work. But we ended up with, with a network that allowed you to connect a computer to it. The computer could say which of the output wires, essentially, on that network you wanted the bits to go to. And when you put them in, it would say where they were going. And when they popped out, it would say where they came from. Mm -hmm. But it was all contained within one net. Mm -hmm. Now, if you wanted to have another network involved, mm -hmm. there was no way within the constructs of the way the ARPANET worked or the host protocols worked that would let you identify a random machine in some other part of the world on some other network. No way to make an internet. Right. Not without without the effort to, to recreate it. Yeah. <clears throat> 
Furthermore, the ARPANET had a number of very uh, uh, important features that were really useful for computing, namely it, it was intended to get the data reliably to the other end, mm -hmm. just directly, you know. So if the data didn't get there, the, the basic assumption was something was broken. You know, so like, I mean, if you were going to print something on your printer and it didn't print, you'd assume there's something broken there. Whereas if you're in a, a, a more realistic communications environment, let's say with radio communications, you may not be communicating for some very good reasons that has nothing to do with it, something being broken. Mm -hmm. Like if you're in a tunnel, a radio wave is not likely to get to you unless they've taken steps to sure. you know, radiate the signal in the tunnel. If you're behind a mountain, the signal may not get through the mountain. Um, you could be in uh, an, an area where there's a lot of interference, you know, intentional or otherwise. So there are many reasons why, you know, in in a, let's say a radio net, you just might not be able to communicate. Yeah. But nothing's broken in in the canonical sense of what that term yeah. means. Um, and so I, I knew we needed to have a different way of of dealing with it. So we we had to deal with the issue of unreliability along the way, and we had to deal with the issues of addressability. And those were two of the main issues that led to the reconceptualization of the protocols. And we called it TCP at the time. Mm -hmm. And later, we took the part of it that dealt with the Internet Protocol and sort of broke it out and made a separate, uh, uh, separate thing. That's where the name TCP IP came from. So the IP part had to do with addressing the machines and, and having the networks route based on IP addresses. Mm -hmm. And the TCP part was sort of the end-to-end -end piece of the protocol that lets you put the things back together again. Sure. Because these nets could be all different. And one net might take big packets and the next one might want little ones. So they mm -hmm. have to chop these packets into little pieces and separately address them. They may take different routes and you'd have to figure out how to put them together and where the pieces go at the other end. And so that's what the protocol did. You might get duplicates, things could be retransmitted, they could come out of order, things could be missing. And so the protocol really was intended to deal with that. And there was a whole, a whole effort to really think that through as a kind of a logical framework for putting together networks independent of what the actual networks were. Mm -hmm. And I think the, um, you know, the beauty of that original design was it seems to have accommodated virtually every kind of network that's come about since then and allowed it to be part of this federation of networks because the architecture was not about the underlying network but about the means of, by which they could uh, interact with each other. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was a separate activity. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how, how many uh, protocols and technologies have sort of come and gone, and you know, TCP PIP is so resilient. You know, I, I remember it was like X.25 was going to take over the world and, and, yeah. and didn't, you know? Well, a lot of people used it, and it's yeah. probably still around in a few places, although it was basically a virtual circuit uh, Connection arrangement. Um, the thing, the thing also about um, the internet was that uh, it wasn't done as an abstract development. Because when I got to DARPA, one of the first things that I did was I got involved with the creation of um, two other nets. One, one network had actually been started a little earlier, but more as a kind of a modem connection between nodes on the ARPANET. Um, and we turned that development into a kind of a standalone net with separate interfaces and kind of gateways between them. They could be called routers now. Mm -hmm. And another effort to build something called a packet radio net, mm -hmm. which is a kind of forerunner of today's CDMA technology, sure. if you're familiar with yeah. that. It was the packet radio networks, well, they involved nodes that were maybe a cubic foot in size. They weighed about 50 or 70 pounds, you could lug these devices. You certainly wouldn't put them in a short pocket. No. And in the, in the mid-1970s, they cost about $50,000 each. So that might be the equivalent of maybe two hundred and fifty or $350,000 today. So these were very expensive units. Yeah. But I believe, um, and the history will probably uh, you know, show that this was, if not the very first system, one of the very first to use embedded microcomputers because mm -hmm. the microprocessor had just been invented when, I, when we started that project. Um, it was an Intel 8008 mm -hmm. that was a, just become available. I mm -hmm. guess the first one was a 4004. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we ended up using something called the National M16, which was the first 16-bit micro that was on the market. And it also had 
spread spectrum technology embedded in this little mm-hmm. box. Well, previously this was a technology that had been used in a number of uh, applications. The ones I knew about were all military ones sure. to to you know, to deal with making signals work over very large bands. You know, so that you could. For example, reduce interference and get the profile of the signal down, mm-hmm. or or make it resistant to eavesdropping or jamming. Right. Yeah. So we ended up demonstrating how this could actually work, and we had gotten surface acoustic wave devices from, I guess, Texas Instruments built the first versions that we used, and some more advanced versions from Lincoln Labs, and we actually showed how this could all work, and we fielded these units, and we built small networks of you know something like. 30 or 60 nodes, Mm -hmm. and the technology worked. So we had packet radio network Mm -hmm. that ran at something like 100 to 400 kilobits, that range. We had the ARPANET, which was at that point a 50 kilobit per second leased line network. And then we had this packet satellite net that we had created on Intelsat 4. And so we had three different nets, three different data rates, different packet sizes, different interfaces. And, And we had a very tangible issue of how to put them all together. Sure. And that was really the genesis of the Internet Project. Ah. So you had networks that you needed to integrate. Yeah, it wasn't an abstract theoretical thing. We actually had a real test. Sure. I I might point out that the way the Internet piece of it actually got started was more an integral part of of the packet radio program because you couldn't carry around computers with you in those days. I mean, they're all million-dollar million machines. You needed big air-conditioned rooms. They were, you know, as large as a very large 30-ton air conditioning unit might be today. They're big mm-hmm. units, you know. And, and even memory, you know, was in, you know, a megabyte of memory was was a huge rack of cabinets, not yeah. a little chip back in those days. You couldn't carry them around with you. And if you wanted to get computing on a packet radio net, you really needed to connect to some other net that had the computers on them unless you were willing to compute off some trivial device. Yeah. Um, so there was good motivation to have this capability, but you know, the way DARPA typically worked back then was uh, you, know, you needed somebody that could make use of this on the military side. I mean, normally what DARPA did was to try and meet the real needs of the Defense Department going mm-hmm. forward. So he, here we were in a situation where um, the military basically had no computers. I mean, maybe they had a few for accounting purposes yeah. or for some specialized uh, purpose. They were generally batch machines, mm-hmm. you know, and they crank for hours and they spill it, spill out, you know, line printer output. Uh, but they didn't have any time sharing systems to speak yeah. of, or they really hadn't happened yet. This was again, think think about the early seventies. Yeah. Um, so they didn't really have any need for networks to hook up to the computers they didn't have. Yeah, of course. And therefore they didn't have the need for something to interconnect the networks that they didn't have. <laughs> they didn't have any, they didn't need to connect you know, two or more of the ones they didn't have to the computers they didn't have. So it didn't really fit the traditional mold of no. um, you know, what would happen. And so we were able to get it started you know, sort of under the radar screen by just doing it as part of the packet radio program because uh-huh. that, that program needed it to make the radio network and then eventually it took on a life of its own uh, from I would say roughly 1975 on. Wow. It, 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 uh, in retrospect, um, in developing the TCP IP protocol, would you have done it differently? Is there something you wish you'd done differently? You know, that, that's a question people often ask, and it's very hard to answer because you you have the, um, you know, all the retrospective of the of history to deal with. I mean, how do you think radio and television would have been changed if we had semiconductor technology and lasers back in 1900? I mean, you can't, you sure, can't dramatic. run that experiment. You can't run that experiment. Oh, I mean, yeah, I know. It's my you know it, ask unfair questions. You know it would be different, yes. but... I mean, it's it's a totally unrealistic uh, experiment to try to run uh, because sure. you know, it's just the context is all different. I mean, I think we did a reasonably good job. Could have could have been better in some ways. Yeah, probably. I mean, I can give you some examples of things that we chose to do back then that, in retrospect, looked pretty silly. You know, we we knew 
uh, that we needed more address space. The ARPANET had 16-bit addresses. Mm -hmm. The way you address something was you spelled out in the 16 bits you know, which machine you wanted to go to. Well, guess what? They're all on one net, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to say what net, but you had to say what node of the net to go to, and then you had to say which wire out of the net. There were four wires, so you could connect four machines, basically. Um, and so that's what it was. It was sort of like two bits to say which of the four wires, and then another, I guess, six bits to say which of the 64 nodes that you could handle, and so those were using eight of the 16 bits. Yeah. And maybe there were a few more used for other minor purposes, but to first order, that's what happened in the ARPANET. We, we said, well, if we're going to go to a larger set of networks, we need more bits, so we went to 32 bits. And our thought was, that's this, enough. this is going to be good for the indefinite future. <laughs> I mean, what we did was we took the 32 bits and said, we'll take the first eight and use that to designate which net. Well, if you figure out how many combinations of eight bits you can have, there are 256 combinations. And we figured, well, AT&T would probably have a net of their own, and maybe the Defense Department, that was two. Uh, maybe there'd be one in Europe, that's three. We figured, you know, maybe there'd be one in Japan or Asia Pacific or something, that'd be four. We double it, that's eight. Let's double it again, that's 16. Double it again, that's 32. And no matter how we could calculate it, 256 seemed to be more than we'd ever need. But what did we not think about? Well, we hadn't, we hadn't contemplated the personal computer being generated. We hadn't been thinking about local area nets to connect lots of uh, computers in one building, for example. But within a very short time after that, all of that hit us. Yeah. You know, because Xerox Park came out with their, um, their Altos and the, the Ethernet came right on the heels of it. So very quickly we realized that 8 bits wasn't going to, to do it. And so we had a kind of rethink how we were going to deal with that. We still kept the 32 bits. In fact, there's still 32 bits today. It's what's yeah. called version 4 of the IP protocol, um, IPv4. But um, people are now trying to move toward a 128-bit version, which is called IPv6. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to make those transitions. Um, anytime you move from one regime in which all the pieces sort of work together and you try and change some pieces, yeah. then you always got the issues of backward compatibility and how do you make the transition happen in a smooth fashion. So uh, that was one of the things that I think uh, we, didn't, we didn't get quite right initially, but we had enough flexibility in the system sure. to cope with it. Oh yeah, the fact uh, that we're still, we're still using functioning it. with 32-bit right. addressing. But we, we knew within six months to a year after that that 8 bits wasn't going to hack it. Really? But we thought 8 bits was perfectly fine when we did the original work. You know, I'm reminded of the comments that people often make about, uh, you know, the origins of the computer where some, I was a, maybe Watson of IBM had prognosticated that we'd only need a handful of these for the whole country. Or in the early days of the automobile industry when people thought that you don't need a handful of automobiles to handle the needs. So, you know, sometimes these early views of, of what you think is reasonable can be overtaken pretty sure. quickly. So those sure. are some. We we thought about security right early on, but we knew that uh, if if we had to go figure out how to put security into the network in, in the sense of real security from you know a military point of view, we never would have gotten this network built. Mm -hmm. It would have been so cumbersome, and we wouldn't have been able to deploy them in the universities. And I mean, it just would have been a non-starter. But today, people are still struggling with issues of. You know, security, and not necessarily in the military sense, but just in the sense of knowing who you're talking to, and you know, knowing uh, what sites you're connected to, and so forth. So, I, I think some of those issues will get resolved mm -hmm. over the course of the, the coming uh, coming years. But um, that's one of the things we probably could have attended to. Well, how could you have known? I mean, if if you were sitting, you know, wherever you were sitting, figuring this out, you invent, you know, you didn't sit around saying, "Well, I wonder if someone's going to do a, you know, a, a denial of service attack on our network." Do you think about things like that? Well, we we weren't we weren't focused on it. I mean, I I have to say it occurred to us, but we were more concerned. You did? I I think we were more concerned with how do we make this darn thing work? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, just to give you an example, when I was doing the original ARPANET. Work. One of the things I was worried about was what I called deadlocks in the net. You know, too many packets showing up at one node, so that its buffers got all filled up, and maybe the buffers at the nodes nearby it got filled up or something, so that nothing would move. You'd end up in a deadlock situation. 
Well, that's essentially a denial of service kind of mm -hmm. thing, but it happens naturally. Mm -hmm. And of course, a, a lot of the 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 concerns that were uh, eventually to come to come to pass, you know, were viewed as not being realistic to have to worry about. It'd be like worrying about in this room, maybe all the oxygen molecules will just happen to wander up in the corner and will all suffocate. Well, I mean, you can worry about that and therefore require every room to have a fan just to keep the air molecule circulated. And in, in some environments, it's actually not a bad idea. Yeah. But uh, as a practical matter, nature seems to do a pretty good job of keeping the oxygen molecules circulated in, in most environments. I don't know if anybody that's ever suffocated from the air molecules just happened to randomly walk, go into a corner of a room. No, I think that... I think that... Uh, I think it works just the opposite. I think they, and never mind. <laughs> um, so we've already established that you had a hard time imagining the network being as big as it is. And was there a point where you came to adjust that feeling to think it's going to be everywhere? Well, remember, we were thinking of this as a research experiment. Sure. How do we connect computers, get them to work across multiple nets? Mm -hmm. um, it was a it was a technologist's challenge. Yeah. We weren't worried about how big is it going to get because we weren't trying to grow it necessarily on day one. Now, in time, more and more sites wanted to get added. How do we get to participate? And suddenly it started to develop a kind of a life of its own and, yeah. and, and, and a growth rate of its own. And so somewhere along the way, we clearly realized that, that this was getting to be a bigger thing and it would need to be managed in a more serious way. I mean, I used to, you know, create IP addresses and write them on index cards in my pocket. I mean, today we have whole institutions in the world fighting over who should be able to do that. And it was, you know, something, somebody call up and say, you know, can I get on the net? I need an IP address. And we'd write one down, give it to them. And that was it. I mean, nobody even thought that there was a business there. And today it's probably bringing in a few billion dollars a year. Sure is. Just, uh, so, so uh, was there a, a box where the index cards went? I never kept more than one, because when it got all filled up, I asked, there was a fellow at uh, USC named John Postel, uh -huh. and he had been keeping track of the host names for the ARPANET. So, mm -hmm. you know, when a new site came on, we gave it a name like MIT or UCLA or whatever. Yeah. And John was sort of the, um, I don't know, I mean, it was almost like a green eye shade job in those days. Mm -hmm. um, but as it got bigger and bigger, it became something to be staffed and managed. And John really became the, the kind of all, well, he was the, the conscience of the net in, mm -hmm. in, in the protocol sense. Is this a good thing to add? Is it not a good thing to add? Uh, with regard to things like domain names and IP addresses and all of the things surrounding it, uh, he began to play a lead role. In, and he did that for some 20 odd years until it became almost overwhelming in the light of all of the issues uh, swirling around, lawsuits flying about mm -hmm. who could have what dom domain names and so forth, top-level domains. Uh, and finally, that led to the setting up of something called ICANN, uh, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which you know is still housed in the same building where John was out in Marina del Rey. But mm -hmm. uh, no, my my index card never got to two. My numbers never got to two, so there was no box for because all I had was one of them. And when that filled up, you know, John picked it up and, and took it up. But we didn't have a lot of entries for the first few years. I mean, mm -hmm. we had a very small set of research participants, and so you know, I could probably have kept the list in my head. Of course, a lot of the expansion of the net came from when it was opened up from the research community into in that was what 1987. Well, it, it, it occurred in two steps. Yeah. Um, when I left uh, DARPA in the end of 85, mm -hmm. uh, NSF had already expressed serious interest in getting into the networking business. Um, Eric Block had taken over as director of NSF in 1984, I believe, and he was very interested in, in that, mainly to expand the power of networking to the research and educational community more broadly mm -hmm. within the U.S. And, and to some extent around the world. And NSF ended up playing that role. Uh, DARPA decided to get out of the lead role of networking uh, right right in the middle of the 1980s. And NSF really picked up the mantle. They created something called the NSF Net, which was a higher bandwidth net. They went mm -hmm. they went from the ARPANET speeds up to one and a half megabits, a factor of some 30 higher. Mm -hmm. 
um, and they used that to link together many different parts of the nation. And it was a very, uh, uh, very ambitious project. Um, the gentleman who led that over there was uh, a fellow Princeton graduate. We had, in fact, the same thesis advisor at Princeton. Um, which one? Had, John Thomas was his name. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, which the, 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 he had two, didn't he? Effectively, yeah, two. this was the first one. <laughs> okay. Um, and this, this fellow at NSF was named Steve Wolf, and, mm -hmm. and Steve was really the architect of, of um, sort of moving it from this research phase into yeah. a much more operational phase, mainly for the university community and the research community. And he did a pretty remarkable job over there. He had help from a lot of people, of course and managed to work the politics of the government, got people from the Department of Energy and NASA and others eventually to pitch in, along with DARPA, of course, which had been there before. And by building on top of what we had started with DARPA, it really made the, the Internet as we know it today uh, come about. Now, it probably would have stayed as a network for the research community uh, or maybe for research and governmental use had not there been an effort that was spearheaded by... Uh, a congressman named Rick Boucher from Virginia uh, to open up the NSF net to broader usage. I don't know exactly whether the bill called it commercial use or not, but mm -hmm. normally a government facility is used for government business, and this allowed NSF to open it up for other activities. So some of the commercial nets could now connect to it, and traffic could flow over both of them, um, you know, without some kind of a, a policy on acceptable use. Mm -hmm. And that's really what opened it up uh, to the broader community. And it happened just about the same time as the uh, world was discovering the World Wide Web. Mm -hmm. So the web browser um, was sort of a, a very visible entity by 94, 95. Sure. But by 93, it was first beginning to become available in lots of places, mainly due to the efforts at the University of Illinois which, incidentally, we had been involved uh, with to some extent because we had funded them to build an early version of one of the point-click browsers. Mm. But they used it mainly to connect to their supercomputer simulations, and some other people there then took that idea and used it to connect up to the World Wide Web, and that's really how the web, the, the modern web browsers we now see it was created. There have been other efforts by other people, and probably including Tim Berners-Lee, to try and do similar things before. But this one really got some traction, took off, and, of course, uh, when Netscape was formed in, I guess, uh, 94 sometime, uh, it just caused the whole thing to explode. And I think the, the Jim Clark's uh, credit, who was the founder of that, Mark Andreessen, who left from Illinois, they really put that on the map and made the, the web a premier means of information access today. Not the last word, but it's mm -hmm. just like the ARPANET was the first word in computer networking. Sure. The web is really the first word in network-based information access in a broad sense. And I think we'll see that evolve over time as people get more and, and better ideas. Do you view this as your baby? What's the this? The, the Internet or, the, you know, the, the protocol. The, you know, I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about, you, you have to. And so it seems to me... If you have some kind of paternal feelings about this, you must be concerned about how it's growing up. Well, you know, people all the time write about the Internet, and, and very often you'll see a headline entitled something like, paternity, paternity suit over the Internet, because you'll find three or four people arguing about who did what. Oh, yeah. The, um, the, the so-called fathers of the, the Internet. Fathers of the Internet. Um, I, I would put it this way. We've had a major success on our hands, clearly. I mean, just coming back from the World Summit in Tunis uh, a week or two ago, you know, every nation in the world has discovered the Internet. It's, I don't think, going away anytime soon, and may, maybe this form of intercommunication will be here to stay. I mean, just like, you know, the interplay between cities took place and we moved away from localities to a broader global economy. Um, many people were part of that. Um, it certainly never would have taken on the the current uh, uh, strains of, uh, uh, of of the technology if it hadn't been for all the investments made by companies. That wouldn't have been made if we didn't have the personal computer invented, if we didn't have the software to, to go along with that. The semiconductor industry hadn't enabled all of that. Um, if we hadn't had the legacy of what came before us, I couldn't have done what I did. I mean, 
people had been thinking about networking before. I was not the first to think about those ideas. Um, Len Kleinrock and Paul Barron were early writers on the subject. Um, Len did a PhD thesis on uh, managing yeah. managing networks. Paul Paul had looked at the issue of uh, communication in the nuclear environment. How would you survive nuclear threats? And his his work started out by saying, well, maybe we ought to link the AM radio stations because some of them will surely be able to survive. And maybe if they can send messages and they can get picked up by another AM radio station, we could relay them around. This was an era before we had uh, really VLSI technology. Uh, they were hypothesizing discardable electronics, but nobody quite knew how to do that in any reasonable sense. We didn't have small enough computers. So implementation-wise, it was pretty unrealistic. But they didn't have a Jules Verne-like issue of having to wait a very long time before you could take an idea <coughs> and cause it to become real. <coughs> so you know, when DARPA started the ARPANET activity in the late 1960s, um, it wasn't that far away from when those ideas were articulated. Sure. But, you know, I think what DARPA did was kind of a fresh look at what they did. And, of course, I had been starting to work on those ideas at BBN independent of DARPA. And when I learned what they were doing, you know, it just seemed a natural fit. So I became part of the process. So having been involved in the design and, and, and the implementation of the very first computer network, I, I sort of feel a connection to the very early stages. Mm -hmm. And then having developed uh, uh, the packet radio net and, and caused these these three nets to then come together was sort of right at the, the birthplace of this whole idea. Vint and I worked together on the protocols very intensively. Um, I brought him into the mix because I knew a lot about the communication side of it. He knew a lot about the computing piece of it, and that was that was the fit we needed. But it would probably be a disservice to people like uh, Larry and Len and, and others to sort of say that uh, you know, their work wasn't relevant to this whole run-up because oh, sure. if you take a look at what was on, on the ARPA, and it was a microcosm of what the Internet later became. Mm -hmm. People were communicating between different computers and all of the issues that we later had to deal with at the applications level existed in the ARPANET. Mm -hmm. It's just it was one net instead of lots and lots of nets. But what made it propagate and flourish was the ability to have lots and lots of nets work together. So yeah. it wasn't one company in Cambridge that was running the network for the world. It was everybody doing their own thing in this open architecture environment. Mm -hmm. So that's the real contribution I think I made to the internet piece was sort of understanding this open architecture environment, uh, understanding a framework that could allow for these different nets to federate. And, and, and specifying with Vint and the details of how those interfaces would actually get implemented. What, what are you doing today? Having a wonderful interview with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> other than that, what, I mean, you know, how do you, you still wear a tie? You know, you're, you're a medal winner, we just learned. Yeah, and, yeah. and so, uh, where are you, you know, what, what responsibility do you have or do you feel about this area that, that you were so involved in? Well, um, let me mention a couple of things. First of all, I'm still involved to some extent because even though I haven't been working on the hardcore issues of the Internet now for, for quite a while, we still have the responsibility for the standards process for the Internet. Although we're just about to turn that over, uh, hopefully within the next month, to the community of researchers who have been essentially evolving the Internet. So one of the issues with the Internet was how do you take something that's open architecture where lots of different manufacturers can build things where they all have to somehow work together mm -hmm. and allow it to evolve. Yeah. It's one thing when one company builds everything, they can figure out a phasing strategy to change over everything. But um, And so we created something called the Internet Engineering Task Force a number of years ago. Uh, really started out of some efforts at DARPA in the late 70s that Vint and I put together. And it sort of evolved. And Vince still involved as chair of ICANN to this day, and, but he may step down as, as that within the same time frame. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so still. So is the Internet Engineering Task Force going away then? No, it's going to stay, except that instead of the responsibility staying with us, we're going to hand it over to the actual community of the thousands of folks out there who are responsible for it. They've got their own structure of how they're organized. Uh, what we did back in the early 1990s was we sort of separated out the administrative part of it from the technical part and said let's let the community
be responsible the, for the technical part. We'll retain the administrative part. Originally, we had both responsibilities by virtue of a cooperative agreement from the National Science Foundation. Yeah. So that's that's happened, you know, gradually over time, and so it seems like the right next step. Um, the the thing that I've been most interested in for the last ten or fifteen years was actually work that uh, we began here at CNRI back in the mid 1980s. I'm trying to understand sort of what the network might look like in the future if uh, you were worrying about managing information mm -hmm. instead of just moving bits. We came up with the notion of mobile programs in the net. We called them NOBOT programs, mm -hmm. where NOBOT was a coined term meaning knowledge robots. Yeah. So these would be programs that would move through the net looking for information and be able to do computation and, and bring things back. We've seen a little bit of that happen the in the spiders, form of like spiders and various crawlers, but this was much more powerful powerful notion. And as part of that work, um, we we broke it into two different pieces, one of which was sort of the piece that deals with mobility and another piece that deals with just the management, assuming you know where the information is. Um, and I call that latter activity, although it really it bridges both uh, digital object architecture. and. Uh, um, it's actually won some awards. It got the 19, the 2003 Digital ID World Award mm -hmm. for combining innovation with practical reality. Um, it was an attempt on my part to rethink the internet architecture around managing information. So, I mean, if I wanted to sort of describe this in a nutshell, if you were to let all the information you cared about go onto the internet, would you trust that? as a going forward kind of activity. That's one thing if you trusted it to a place to keep it, like an AOL or a Google or a Yahoo mm -hmm. or an IBM or something like that, um, and many people do, or maybe they trust it to themselves, yeah. but if you've got it on lots of machines and those machines can be in different places or the publishers are creating stuff and they've got it here and then it, they move the content there, how do, how do you keep track of all of the stuff when this material can move from place to place, and how do you manage it over generations of technology, mm -hmm. so that you know if if you don't run into the situation where you you click on something and five years from now or fifty years from now you can't find it anymore because yeah, exactly. links are broken. So we came up with I came up with this architecture, which is a digital digital object architecture, which really has like three or four different components. One component is it's sort of it, it, by, by the way, Bob. It has about sixty seconds worth of components. <laughs> we have a minute to go. We're going to run out of tape. Well, maybe you can cut off the first part. But in any event, uh, one aspect of it is the digital object as the yeah. main lingua franca, as opposed to just moving packets. Number two is a resolution mechanism that allows you to take identifiers to these objects because every object has to have a unique identifier. Mm -hmm and be able to resolve it to information about the object, call it metadata if you like, mm -hmm. that, that among other things might let you find it, authenticate it, or you know whatever, or understand terms and conditions for using it. Uh, third, um, a more general purpose means of storing these objects, call them repositories, which is not a specification for a hardware or software storage system. You can use anything you like, any commercial database system, any flat file system, memory chips, whatever, mm -hmm. or they can be in motion. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, registries of one sort or another that allow for some kind of authentication and, and metadata substance in the, in the Is this large. Is being implemented? Anywhere? Yeah, we've, we've implemented all the components of it, and we've had it on the net. The resolution system is called the handle system. It's been on the net for over 10 years. It is a premier uh, resolution system. Uh, the publishing community is using it widely. Um, and most of the electronic journals that are available on the net or that will be available in electronic form are now using them for, among other things, references at the back, because they would like you to be able to take these journals 100 years from now, sure. be able to click on those references and still get them, even though you don't even know where they are, who, who owned them, and they may be in lots of different places. Yeah. And to be able to, I actually think that the power of this digital object architecture is potentially as important as the power of the internet framework that we had originally developed, because it's dealing with the substance of what's important to most people in their daily lives. Um, I mean, it's one thing to be able to communicate with others. We've known about that for a long time. But the ability to manage your medical records, your financial records, your personal papers, the things that you care about, 
they're not going to be publicly available for the search engines to go find. And I mean, if you go and, and try and locate, uh, you know, Hamlet, it's not clear that through a typical search today on the net, you're going to necessarily find the text. You might find all the articles written about Hamlet. But you really want to go to the end thing. If you want to find your medical record, you want that record. You want to know it's your record, yeah. especially if a doctor is going to rely on it. Yeah. So the whole object of that architecture is to deal with these kind of things so that you can literally manage your information over very long periods of time. And once you've made the investment in the information, what you'd really like to do is to know that that information it doesn't have to be recreated every yeah. time you change your software, every time you change your hardware. And in, in some sense, it's flying in the face of a lot of the business culture, which would like you to do that. Sure. And for many things, that's fine. I mean, I'm totally in favor of, you know, buying upgrades and, and whatever it is that keeps that industry vibrant. Mm -hmm. But, you know, once you've built your address base, you know, it you really don't want to have to redo it every time just because somebody's got a better database system for yeah. retaining things. You want to be able to port the objects from mm -hmm. one thing to another once you've created it and not have to keep recreating it over time. The same thing is true of data structures. If you're, for example, in uh, you know, the, uh, the intellectual property arena, you create a literary work or a musical work, you don't want to have to keep recreating the same literary work or the same musical work just because the technology has changed. You'd sure. like to be able to have that expressed work in whatever the form that your original data structure was mm -hmm. be preservable over time and manifested by different kinds of technology and, and platforms. be able to just refer to it. That's right. Yeah. Unlike object-oriented programming, which was a major construct in the computer science arena, where people tried to hide the need for worrying about that detail for the programmer so they could write programs more easily and make the flexibility of that easier, for somebody in the intellectual property business, those data structures are their, are their works. They yeah. represent their works. Um, and that's what they want to manage. And so a method applied to an object in the traditional computer science sense mm -hmm. is something that the owner of that would like to license. Of course. Rather than just sort of have it built mm -hmm. in. And so you get a different view of how to manage information but and data do, structures in this model. But you do embrace the concept of inheritance, for example, that like in object-oriented programming. I mean, that's the whole thing that allows this this legacy data to, to, to flow forward, isn't it? Um, or am I just being stupid? What? <laughs> <laughs> it's very important that when you create derivative works that you be able to understand um, either where they came from, if the requirement of the original owner is that you maintain that, one way to do that is by essentially concatenating information in the identifier so you know what the original source was. But there are a variety of ways to do that. In many cases, people don't, don't want to preserve that. They, they say, okay, we'll write a contract with you. Maybe it's offline. And we'll give you the right to take our work and create it any way you recreate it, any way you like. Create any derivative that you want with our approval because you know that was what our contract called for, in which case it's your fresh start drawing upon what I had done or somebody else mm -hmm. had done. And both of those models and, and probably others need to exist in this world. But uh, we, we took a look at this right from day one from the notion of managing intellectual property. Mm -hmm. We branched out from there. So you not only have intellectual property in things like literary works and musical works and, and audiovisual works, things like that that I mentioned, but you've got digital objects of all kinds. Some of those digital objects may not be intellectual property in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. Like they could be contracts, they could be mortgage bundles, they could be things that have value, or just things that you have rights or interests in mm -hmm. in, in some other form. Um, and you want to be able to allow all of that to happen. If, if this were, for example, in the military, maybe it's information that's constrained by other needs uh, of, of access, other sure. requirements for access. Maybe it's in a corporation, the requirements for access are controlled by company policy. Mm -hmm. And you want to be able to allow those kind of access constraints to be built in, right at the object level. Or maybe in pieces of the object, elements of the object themselves. So I, I think this is the kind of issue that, that, that companies, organizations, and individuals of all kinds are going to need to worry about in the future. That's why I'm so excited about it, because oh, I think yeah. the potential is there for this to cause, just like the internet was a federation of a lot of different networks that were all different, 
<clears throat> this architecture allows you to federate information systems sure. that are all different, in including potentially those in the future that we don't even yet envision. Wow. So, in a sense, nothing ever goes away then? Unless you that's decide, your, unless you decide for it to go away. Well, that's your choice. I mean, you can yeah. have. I mean, I wouldn't adopt this situation because I I don't tend to throw away most things that I collect, except that they're you know just trash. Uh, but uh, I mean, you could have a you could have a model that says, throw away everything after six months. Uh -huh. You could have that model built it in, and the system will will keep only the last six months, and everything else might be gone. Now you might do it through some service provider that says, well, regardless of what they tell me, I'm going to keep it anyway, because memory is so cheap, you know, I might as well. Uh, but then you better worry about what happens if you wanted to get rid of it because you didn't want anybody to ever find it. And then, you know, some court asked you to produce it, and they suddenly found that this guy, the service provider, had in fact actually kept it. Mm -hmm. You didn't want them to. So who's, who's going to really decide what happens? And do you write that into detailed contracts? Do you remember all of that? Or you could say keep everything forever. Or you could say get rid of things according to the following style sheets. Or you could say I'm going to write a program, or maybe some company writes a program that allows you to instruct it on what to keep and what to get rid of. And now you're at the vagaries of this program, which program might have thrown away something it might not have, and you may not know mm -hmm. until you actually go and try and look for it and see if you can find it. You know, I had a, a guy. Uh, came to me and he he said that he wanted to uh, he wanted to keep his everything all his records everything about his life that he was he was doing he was a sort of famous person and he said but he didn't want anyone to have access to it because it might be embarrassing to him and and you know what could he do and so I suggested that he encrypt it all with like a you know huge 1024 bit key and then throw away the key and then by the time they developed the technology to crack the key easily He'd be dead. Well, that's if you want to, if you want to discover it, and if anybody's willing to take the time to actually do it. I yeah, mean, exactly. Might not be a bad idea if there's certain information you think you would like to know. I mean, for example, um, or 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 society deserves to know, but not in time to put him in jail. Okay, I I think I'm gonna pass on, on that one, other than to say uh, that one of the things people have thought about, and this would greatly expand the amount of information that we collect, is, is to sort of keep a life history of the person. I mean, maybe you wear a little camera on your lapel or, you know, in your hair, something that sort of records what you do every moment of every day of your life. Ted Nelson does this. Today? He does? Today, he's been doing it for 40 years. Well, it seems to, me, seems to me there may be times you want to turn it off, but uh, that's a no, different. No, Ted doesn't turn it off. Never turns it off. No, pretty much not. But you know, if you could do that and you have a complete history of what you've gone through, um, then somebody could experience your life. Now, maybe this is a person who becomes president of the United States at one point in time, and the country would like to know. But that person doesn't want you to know during his lifetime. Well, maybe that would be an interesting way to find out. On the other hand, most of the really interesting stuff about people are, are, let's say, videos that show them as part of the scene. So you'd almost need to have uh, the need for somebody to be attached to you as an alter ego, essentially recording what you do external to you, not from you looking out, but from them looking at you. That's what Ted would like. <laughs> but he can't afford it. Yeah. Well, I mean, who knows? I mean, maybe if we come back in, in uh, you know, a few hundred years, everybody, maybe it's less than that, a little factotum of sorts that, uh, you know, comes with you. Maybe it rolls on the street like a Segway, or maybe it, uh, you know, sits on your, uh, your lapel, and oh, well, maybe it's got butterfly wings, and it flies off and photographs you from 10 feet away, and it's back on your shoulder when it's no longer interesting. Wow. Who knows? Who knows? I mean, the people with real power are the ones who are allowed to turn it off. I suppose, yeah. Bob, thank you very much. You are so welcome. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is PBS.